attention, duped masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. The enduring octopus, planted computers, and extended battery life. Plus this day in history with another other 9-11 and our song of the day by Marilyn Manson on your morning monarchy for September 12th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome to wherever you are. Good morning. Thank you so much for listening. We are streaming live at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 Pacific time. News, music, and more brought to you by you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks to everybody that joins us in the chat and submits news. We are not only crowdfunded, but we are crowdsourced, my friends. And thank you so much for joining us on our special 12th anniversary episode yesterday. Yes, I know it's the 16th anniversary of 9-11, but that also marks the 12th anniversary of your independent, non-commercial, alternative media powerhouse, Media Monarchy. A huge thanks to our latest patrons, because I think both of them have been previous supporters and donors via PayPal, but they made the plunge and made the pledge over on Patreon.com slash Media Monarchy. So a huge thanks to Michael J. He's been hanging out in the chat. He's in the chat right now. A huge thanks to him and his involvement. Also, Brandy B., she made the jump as well from PayPal to a regular recurring Patreon donation. That's what keeps us going and growing, my friends. Huge thanks to you. If you can give a little, I can give a lot, as I like to say. So since yesterday's episode would have been typically your world news episode, hashtag geopolitics, you know what we're going to do today. We're going to cram that into your cyberspace war, which is typically your news on your Tech Tuesday. Again, all the hashtags, all the stories that we're going to talk about, you can get at the top of the tweets an hour before showtime. We tweet everything out before the show, so if you're listening live, you can follow along and see exactly where we're going and what we're talking about. Let's glance at the breaking lame stream news and see what's happening. And sometimes it works out well. that We get a lot of tech news on a Tech Tuesday, I suppose. That's, that's the way the world has been leaning. Apple apparently has a big, gigantic, exciting event today. Hopefully it'll be about new colored iPhones or all the things you can't do on them anymore. China banks fear U.S. North Korea sanctions. Of course, we've got your latest North Korea stories. Trump plans aggressive roadshow to sell tax overhaul and assessing a Clinton argument that the media helped to elect Trump. I wonder if this finds themselves in that weird sort of vicious circle. How do we support Hillary Clinton while also still waving the bloviating fake news banner? Highly cited, my friends, Hillary Clinton on why she lost and the most important mistake she made. So as long as we're talking about that, let's get into let's get into your fact check. So how are you going to face your day without the fact check from Mainstream Alphabet Incorporated? Kobach's bogus proof of voter fraud from factcheck.org. Claim Florida Governor Rick Scott, who that's the guy that looks like a... Uh, it's crazy Jim Carrey character. Speaking of crazy, we'll have some crazy Jim Carrey coming up a little bit later in this week. Fire Marshal Bill, that's the one. Governor Fire Marshal Bill injured in Irma recovery is fake. That's from PolitiFact. Did Barack Obama attach an ominous message to a letter he wrote to Donald Trump? You gotta hop over to Snopes for that. Mariah Carey, French Montana, did not, all caps, not flirt in the recording studio, despite report that from Gossip Cop. And finally, President Trump's claim that a wall will stop much of the drugs from pouring into this country. From the Washington Post, again, I would imagine they find themselves in the difficult situation of saying, you fools, the president can't build a wall and stop drugs coming into the country. You know that the military brings those in, plus their partners in the farm pharmaceutical industrial complex. They've been doing that for decades. What do you think they were doing over in Vietnam? They were bringing that heroin home to daddy. So that's a look at your fact check, my friends. But there is one other story in the breaking lamestream news that we are going to hop all over. Because it's funny. Senator Ted Cruz said Tuesday that a staff member of his was responsible for liking A pornographic Twitter post with the Texas lawmaker's account chalking up the social media snafu to a mistake. Quote, There are a number of people on the team who have access on the account. It appears that someone inadvertently hit that like button. When we discovered the post, which I was, I guess, an hour or two later, we pulled it down, Ted Cruz said of the incident, it was a staffing issue. And it was inadvertent. It was a mistake. It was not a deliberate act we're dealing with internally, but it was a mistake. It was not malicious. One of those malicious porn tweet likes. Yeah, those are the worst. You got to watch out for those. Ooh, I like you. Cruz told reporters Tuesday it was still being discussed whether the staff member in question would retain access to the senator's social media account. These are the sorts of things that happen. And if your business or job has a Twitter account, this is where you get an email the next day. and was like, yeah, here are the new passwords. I don't know how many times I got new passwords back at the commercial radio station. 
Now, I suppose that does bring up the question that I've wondered, and perhaps you've wondered it as well. I've accidentally hit like buttons, or, or it, it's very easy. Now, with the retweet, there's a confirmation. But with a like, you just accidentally move your big fat finger over it, and it likes. I have wondered how quickly it might take to register. And is it possible that that person on the other end was like, Hey, Media Mark, he liked me. Oh, shit, he didn't anymore. These are the questions that don't keep us up at night, my friends, and let's dive into your hashtag geopolitics slash cyberspace war news, and let's begin, how you like this, with a little bit of good news from our friend the Dealey Lama, Connecticut Governor Daniel Malloy signed HB 7146 on Monday, which curbs Connecticut's civil forfeiture laws. Not only did the bill earn endorsements from the Yankee Institute for Public Policy and the state chapter of the ACLU, HB 7146 even passed both the House and the Senate without a single no vote. Under the new law, in order to permanently confiscate property with civil forfeiture, the property must be seized in connection to either a lawful arrest or a lawful search that results in an arrest. If prosecutors do not secure a guilty verdict, a plea bargain, or a dismissal from finishing a pretrial diversion program, the government must return the property to its rightful owner with a stroke of a pen. Connecticut now becomes the 14th state to require a criminal conviction for most or all forfeiture cases. Civil forfeiture is one of the most serious. See, I'm getting a little scratchiness. Let me work on that real quick. Check one, two. Oh, that's a little better. Always make sure this is, you know, it's good to have a little bit of uh, testing and behind the scenes action. That's right. This is live radio brought to you, not only by you, but it's pretty much just me. I don't have a crew here. Oh, that's the funny part. That's pretty much what it was like at the commercial radio station. Hey, you're going to be your own producer in board op, okay? Okay, but not for long. <clears throat> now that we got rid of that crackle and fuss, good deal. All right, where were we? We were talking about good news. We were talking about Connecticut. And we were talking about civil forfeiture. Civil asset forfeiture, if you're not aware, is when the cops steal your shit because they want it. And they think you might be running a crime. Crimes that usually run counter to their organized crime operations. <laughs> you think you're going to make your own drugs, you fool? You have to buy them from us. Or the other look at it. We can always count on our buddy Citizens Gateway for the contrary view. Stamford Fiat bankers just protected themselves. Civil forfeiture is one of the most serious assaults on Americans' private property rights. The bill is a solid first step to ensure that innocent people do not lose their property to this use of 17th century admiralty law applied to the 21st century war on drugs. Way to bust that out, Senior Legislative Counsel Lee McGrath. According to data obtained by the Institute for Justice and the Reason Foundation, police and prosecutors generated more than $17.8 million in forfeiture revenue from 2009 to 2016. Nearly two-thirds of those proceeds came from civil forfeiture cases where the owner did not have to be convicted. Law enforcement predominantly confiscated cash, but of course, they also love to get their grubby little paws, little hooves on seized dirt bikes, gold chains, and electronics like iPads, TVs, and cell phones. Are you trying to bribe me with evidence? I can just steal it later from the evidence locker. We can begin with a little bit of good news on your geopolitics cyberspace war episode, and you are listening to your Morning Monarchy. It's Tuesday, September 12th, 2017, and I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. His trip to Israel was seen by many as a big Israeli PR stunt, and many took to Twitter to ask whether his trip was sponsored by Israel or Israeli Americans. Who are we talking about? U.S. TV host and comedian Conan O'Brien fed the dog of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu during a visit to Israel last week where he was filming a TV special. During his visit, the late-night host praised Israel's military and hospital staff and took two mocking Palestinians. Here's sit. You must sit. You must sit. There you go. Here's the difference between this dog... And an American dog. No American dog is satisfied with a cucumber. <laughs> we they want two cucumbers. You. Sure. What? What is this? No. It, Meet Kaya. She's paler yeah. than you. Yeah, paler than me. This, this dog. If you tried to give an American dog a cucumber, it would punch you. <laughs> O'Brien met Netanyahu at his residence and took joy in feeding a cucumber to a canine while explaining that no American dog is satisfied with a cucumber. 
During his trip, the 54-year-old visited a hospital in the northern city of Safed and said the doctors there deserve a Nobel Peace Prize for allegedly treating people from a neighboring and enemy country like Syria. Quote, a neighboring and enemy country, end quote. O'Brien boasted about his encounters with Israeli military personnel, whom he described as beautiful women, buff men. He caused a stir after tweeting a picture of himself with two plates of hummus, implying the Palestinian dish is Israeli. O'Brien caused further controversy in another tweet that implied Palestinian market dealers were cheaters. Visited an Arab market and became an expert at haggling, if haggling means paying full retail and then crying. Overall, his trip to Israel was seen by many as a big Israeli PR stunt. Can someone tell me why Conan O'Brien is now a propagandist for Israel? Conan O'Brien's trip to Israel has all the markings of an Israeli government-sponsored Hasbara tour. In 2013, the American comedian garnered angry comments over a racist joke he made on Twitter, which is now not capitalized, which belittled Muslim women. The TV host mocked Marvel's latest Muslim female superhero, Kamala Khan, a 16-year-old American girl who transforms into Ms. Marvel after she is bestowed with special power, saying, quote, Marvel Comics is introducing a new Muslim female superhero. She has so many more special powers than her husband's other wives. So I suppose you could argue he's an equal opportunity offender, or that he is also, I believe, a, a, a comedian. Yep, I, yep, that checks out. He is a comedian. Now, when I first glance at this, I can see people tour around all the time. Comedians, actors, they all go around and kiss ass. That's what they do. Hey, look at me. I'm funny. I'm kissing ass because I've got a show to fill. And this was part of, what do they call it? Laughter in Israel. Conan in Israel. He did a whole week of shows over there, and which is not uncommon. I mean, do a whole week of shows in some country. The stupid Wheel of Fortune does whole weeks of shows in Las Vegas or whatever. But when you add in the extra levels, when you add in the hospital visits, you add in the tweets, you add in the dog, you add in the food. I don't know if he wears a yarmulke under that comb over or not. But they now call him Netanyahu's new poodle as Conan O'Brien rolls over for Israel. Put a little bit of media in your monarchy, but as long as we're talking about corrupt leaders of apartheid nations, let's uh, pile on another one from the Associated Press. With a slew of corruption scandals closing in on him, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is dropping what remains of his statesmanlike persona in favor of an angry nationalism that's popular with his base. That's also popular here as well. See, there's general flavors of things, and you can see it all around the world. That's the same reason a bunch of the same movies will come out at the same time, bands will be playing the same thing. And fake politicians play people like suckers. I think I've made the joke before, playing it like a crappy violin, but a crappy violin would be very difficult to play. The powers that shouldn't be play us like we are a fine Stradivarius. Casting himself as an outsider, the long-serving Prime Minister blames Israel's old guard elites, in quotes, for the array of inquiries into his financial conduct. He's been lashing out against the media and an all-powerful left wing, in quotes, for supposedly conducting a witch hunt against him, while associates have taken to sniping at the court system and police as well. Although this is positive, again, when the powers that shouldn't be all want to fight with each other, that's pretty much good for us. If Israelis, elites, and left-wing, and the cops all want to play, <laughs> rock on. Recent days' headlines have been dominated by arrests of Netanyahu confidants, a court ruling forcing him to reveal phone records, leaks from inside the investigation, and indications that his wife Sarah will be indicted for fraud, as was the style at the time. With each new complication, Netanyahu seems to grow more bellicose. Last week, he visited a West Bank settlement and vowed never to evacuate any settlements on occupied land, his latest indication of backing off from a past pledge to pursue a two-state solution of blah 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 Netanyahu has also pledged to expel tens of thousands of African migrants who managed, who managed to enter illegally before Israel fortified its border with Egypt several years ago because walls work. <sighs> Oh, God, it's so funny. At the cabinet meeting, he spoke at length about the supposed suffering of residents of South Tel Aviv who live in poor neighborhoods alongside a large population of African migrants. He even visited the neighborhood twice, including an undercover mission that allowed him to view conditions firsthand. We've already removed some 20,000 illegal infiltrators whose place is not here. The suffering is unbelievable, and the future implications on the burden of the state of Israel require action now. Yeah, his voice is kind of actually terrifying. It is that big, deep, 
It is a preacher voice. It is a scary politician voice. It is an angry dad that you were never happy that got home. Let's continue to look around the geopolitics world. The U.S. Army wants its forces to be deployed in everywhere around the world all the time. Full spectrum dominance, but sorry, sorry. In this case, we're specifically talking about South Korea. So we can train and war game and military exercise for a potential attack with the use of hazardous materials, which of course could be radioactive or chemical. The Army's 718th Explosive Ordnance Disposal Company, EOD, if you're nasty, in South Korea, should be taught to be able to identify hazardous materials, know how to perform basic control, containment, and or confinement operations, as well as to be able to implement decontamination procedures according to the contact proposal which the Army posted on the Federal Business Opportunities website. Overnight, those new threats from North Korea promises on state television to reciprocate a thousandfold for what it calls America's villainous actions against our country and people, warning that if the U.S. thinks it will be safe because it is across an ocean, there is no bigger misunderstanding than that. The warnings in response to the toughest sanctions ever passed by the U.N. Security Council against North Korea, which North could Korea cost no the regime nearly one billion dollars a year. These sanctions will cut deep, and in doing so will give the North Korean leadership a taste of the deprivation they have chosen to inflict on the North Korean people. Sanctions in the wake of North Korea's alarming progress in its nuclear and missile programs. Kim Jong-un launching a second intercontinental ballistic missile just nine days ago. A missile potentially capable of reaching as far as the eastern U.S. It is now Secretary of State Rex Tillerson's mission as he travels across the region to ensure all parties, especially China, adhere to the sanctions in hopes North Korea finally comes around. Well, the uh, best signal that North Korea could give us that they're prepared to talk would be to stop these missile launches. Um, you know, we've not had uh, a, an extended period of time where they have not taken some type of provocative action uh, by launching uh, ballistic missiles. And that will indeed be the big test, but whether the North Koreans stop the tests or not, the U.S. will give the sanctions time to bite before taking further action, but Secretary Tillerson said there is no time frame for that. I don't know how many times I have to tell you guys, I provide the music bed. I don't need your scary music under that. Now, actually, that video is a compilation of U.S. Army prepares forces in South Korea for WMD attack. It's kind of a compilation on YouTube. They put several different news clips together, which I find pretty handy. I could do without the music bed, but of course it is much, 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 much better than all those terrible videos that go up on YouTube with computer voice reading article. It's expected to be a two-week training course taught on-site at the U.S. Camp Humphreys Base in South Korea. The U.S. has around 25,000 troops deployed in South Korea alone at some 80 sites across the country. Remember there was some crazy guy named Ron Paul who asked questions about why the military was in every country around the world. In late August, the Pentagon posted another proposal for contractors to build walls around four U.S. bases in South Korea to protect them from a potential attack. Every time we hear walls, we should all scream and confetti will fall from the ceiling. You've hit the PSYOP special news word of the day. This all comes at a time of heightened tensions between the U.S. and Pentagon vassal state North Korea following the latter's recent missile test, which Pyongyang called gift packages to the United States. Now, as a reminder, if you're not following the parody DPRK Twitter accounts, you must. Following what North Korea claimed was a hydrogen bomb test on September 3rd, U.S. Defense Secretary Jim Mad Dog Mattis warned of a massive military response to any threat from North Korea against the United States or any of its fair-weather allies. This week, the USSA began the deployment of four new terminal high-altitude area defense, that's THAAD rocket launchers, in Sangju County, some 300 kilometers south of Seoul, in addition to two already operating there. Dozens of protesters got injured by the cops last Wednesday as hundreds took to the streets to oppose the installation of the THAAD system. Oh, you don't want Team America World Police setting up weapons? In your oh, you don't like that? Sounds like you're an insurgent. Oh, you don't like sound wave cannons rolling into your town? Guess you better vote harder. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Tech Tuesday. We call it hashtag cyberspace war.
And it is 9-12-2017, and I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Let's talk a moment about the enduring octopus. Now, pretty often on these shows, we take a moment and go over to MuckRock.com. It's a great site that digs up all kinds of FOIAs. And it's what they do. And they actually teach you how to file your own Freedom of Information Act requests. And whenever we talk about the Enduring Octopus, I'm always keenly interested. What got me interested? There's a West Virginia connection. Over two decades after Danny Casolaro died of alleged suicide in a motel room in Martinsburg, West Virginia, he was investigating the Promise Affair. So over two decades after Danny Casolaro died while investigating the Promise Affair, a recent FOIA response from the National Archives confirms that it truly is the scandal that wouldn't die, where a previous release only saw 4% of the total redacted and nothing withheld in full. This release sees 23% of the pages redacted or withheld in full. The letter from the National Archives suggests that the difference is due to the presence of wiretap information in the Casolaro investigation, a fact which has been previously undisclosed by the government. So this is the part we're learning about, a 20-year-old investigation. And like many times, what we learn, we learn through omission. The National Archives responded to a FOIA request from William Hamilton, the creator of the Promise software. Prosecutors' Management Information Software. It's supposed to be for lawyers. Long story short, the Department of Justice stole the Promise software, installed a backdoor, and sold it to nations and businesses around the world as, hey buddy, check out our great new software. It's got AI backdoors in it. From 20 years ago. The National Archives responded to a FOIA request from William Hamilton, Bill Hamilton, the creator of Promise Software, for boxes two and three, of AAG John Dwyer's files on the Inslaw case, both of which were among boxes labeled the Casolaro investigation. In response, the National Archives released 1,256 pages in full while redacting 208 pages and withholding an entirety of 180 pages. Compared to previous releases of other documents from the files, the increase in the number of redactions and withholdings is significant. In February 2016, NARA responded to a special access review request filed by Muckrock by releasing 2,164 pages out of the 2,258 pages in boxes 1 and 13. The additional, or rather the remaining 94 pages were released with some redactions. One presence for the reason of the additional redactions is because of the wiretaps. Who are they wiretapping? Possibly Bill Hamilton. So considering the scope of the case and the labels on the boxes, the wiretap info likely relates to one of three things. The first is the use of an otherwise wholly undisclosed wiretap used specifically in the monitoring of Danny Casolaro or possibly in the investigation of his death. The former would hardly be surprising given the nature of the case, though it would be significant if it had been used in the latter. The fact that the government had never disclosed their use of a wiretap while maintaining that suicide was the only possibility they ever found plausible would have significantly undermined that claim. It would also require a re-examination of the Department of Justice's apparent ignoring of the contradictory alibis given to them by the main suspect in Casolaro's death. The second possibility is that the wiretap was on William Hamilton, the creator of Promise and head of Inslaw, who was regularly in contact with Danny Casolaro. According to Bill Hamilton, he was repeatedly warned by Sean McDade of the Mounties, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, known for investigating parts of the Promise scandal. The Bill Hamilton's telephone and email communications were being intercepted and monitored. Hamilton states that McDade offered this as a statement rather than an opinion. Similar to above, this would be consistent with the scope and importance of the case while still being something the government has refused to confirm. The only likely possibility that wouldn't add much additional information is if the wiretap related primarily to Robert Booth Nichols, who is known to have been subject to physical and electronic surveillance due to his high-level connections with organized crime, quote-unquote organized crime. Due to his well-publicized death and the prior disclosure of the wiretap and the public disclosure of the affidavit in support of the application for it, Robert Booth Nichols is the least likely person to have had this information withheld. While the details of those wiretaps might justifiably still be withheld, they're unlikely to have been included in these files and Robert Booth Nichols' file was maintained in a separate folder. 
So this is a deep story, and there is a lot to go through here. So regardless of withholding the material, the National Archives response confirms the use of a wiretap, which was relevant to the Casalaro investigation. While the vague information still nevertheless significant and shows how much we still don't know about all this. They call it the Enduring Octopus, what FOIA withholdings reveal about the promise scandal. Government claims wiretaps, the CIA Act, and pending proceedings justify withholding documents on Danny Casolaro's mysterious death. And as is noted in the chat by our buddy Head in a Jar, Danny Casolaro, the knifeophobe who deeply cut both wrists with his non-dominant hand. His family works in the medical field. They always said, oh, Danny, oh, he was the biggest wimp. He never hated blood. We knew he was never going to go into the medical field like his dad and like his brother. Just one of the numerous, numerous, numerous inconsistencies in a case. But I know, no, no, I know what they say. Shut up, conspiracy theorists. You can actually find Robert Stack talking about Danny Castellaro on old clips of Unsolved Mysteries. A maid at a hotel in Martinsburg, West Virginia. You are listening to The Morning Monarchy. I am James Evan Plato, and I'm originally from West Virginia. I got 10 years of college radio work there. Got a lot of work of commercial radio here in my background. And we've been Media Monarchy for 12 years and a day. And I'm glad you're here. A laptop that Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz has frantically fought to keep prosecutors from examining may have been planted for police to find by her since-indicted staffer Imran Awan, along with a letter to the U.S. Attorney. Now, I believe we mentioned this just as a breaking headline when we saw it last week. We were probably actually even doing the Daily DJ set at noon. The ongoing story of the DNC links, the ongoing story of the Awan brothers. Another exclusive from Daily Caller. Police report indicates Wasserman Schultz IT aid planted computer for investigators to find. If the member loses the equipment, says they lose the equipment, and it is found by the Capitol Police, it is supposed to be returned. If ownership has been established, right. it'll be returned. If it's subject uh, to an ongoing investigation, there are additional things okay. that need to be turned but over. Not an ongoing investigation related to the member. If the equipment belongs to the member, it has been lost. They say it's been lost and it's been identified as that member's and the Capitol Police is supposed to return it. Correct? Well, it's not a... a, I can't give a yes or no answer on that because I know... It's a simple yes or no answer. If if a member loses the equipment and it is found by the Capitol Police or your staff and it is identified as that member's equipment and the member is not associated with any case and that is their equipment, it is supposed to be returned. Yes or no? Depends on the circumstances. Uh, and if the circumstances I, are... I, I don't understand how that's possible. Members' equipment is members' equipment. It is not... It is not... It, under my understanding, the Capitol Police is not able to confiscate members' equipment when the member is not under investigation. It is their equipment, and it's supposed to be returned. Well, I think there are extenuating circumstances in this case, and I think, I think that, you know, working through my counsel and... Um, you know, the necessary personnel, if, if that in fact is the case, and with the permission of, through the investigation, then we'll return the equipment. But until that's accomplished, I can't return the equipment. I think you're violating the rules when you, when you conduct your business that way and should expect that there would be consequences. Oh, oh man. I think she's squirming. I think she's panicking. Oh, and uh, speaking of being suicided, like Danny Casalaro, I would probably put... Debbie Wasserman Schultz up on Doug Stanhope's celebrity death pool. U.S. Capitol Police found the laptop after midnight, April 6th, 2017, in a tiny room that formerly served as a phone booth in the Rayburn House office building, according to Capitol Police report reviewed by the Daily Caller News Foundation's investigative group. Now, they actually have a photo along with this. So when you hear, oh, they found Schultz's laptop in a phone booth in D.C., it was not on U Street outside some sketchy club. It was still in the Capitol buildings. It was in the Rayburn House office. They have a photo. It was a phone booth much like this. And if you've been in office buildings, basically, you know, it's like the little closet rooms. You could go in there and do a little bit of work. It looks like a little 
Looks like a little office booth. It is not a phone booth as we popularly remember them, if you still actually have any in your city. We do still have a few phone booths here in Portland. They are generally giant graffiti monuments. So they found this thing in the Rayburn House office building. They found it in D.C., in Capitol buildings. They didn't find it on the street. Alongside the laptop was a Pakistani ID card, copies of Ewan's driver's license and congressional ID badge, and letters to the U.S. attorney. Police also found notes in a composition handbook marked attorney-client privilege. The laptop had the username Rep DWS. Dancing with the suicide, even though the Florida Democrat and the former Democratic National Committee chairman previously said it was Awan's computer and that she had never seen it. Awan was banned February 2nd from the Congressional Computer Network because he is a suspect in a cybersecurity investigation, but he still had access to House facilities because Wasserman Schultz continued to employ him. The laptop was found on the second floor of the Rayburn building, a place Ewan would have had no reason to go because Wasserman Schultz's office is in the Longworth building, and the other members who employed him had fired him already. Wasserman Schultz used a televised May 18th congressional hearing on the Capitol Police budget to threaten consequences if Chief Matthew Verderosa did not give her back the laptop. If a member loses equipment, it should be given back, she said, and you just heard that. Verderosa told her the laptop couldn't be returned because it's tied to a criminal suspect. Wasserman Schultz reiterated that while Awan was a suspect, the computer should be returned because it's if it's a member's if the member is not under investigation. She changed her story two months later, claiming it was Awan's laptop, bought with taxpayer funds from her office, and she had never seen it. She said she only sought to protect Awan protect Awan's rights. This was not my laptop, she said on August 3rd. I've never seen the laptop. I don't know what's on the laptop. Awan, his wife, Hina Alvi, and two of his Pakistani-born brothers are at the center of a joint FBI Capitol Police cybersecurity criminal investigation of their IT work for dozens of Democratic House members. Awan was arrested by the FBI at Dulles International Airport July 25th while trying to board a flight to his native Pakistan, and then he got indicted on four counts of bank fraud in connection with his wire transfer of nearly $300,000 to Pakistan the day before. The bank fraud charges are tangential to the cybersecurity probe. The circumstances of the laptop appearance described in the police report suggest Wasserman Schultz was trying to keep the police from reviewing a laptop that Awan himself may have wanted them to find. The former phone booth room where police found the item is small and there is no obvious reason to enter it. Leaving important items there accidentally would seem extremely unlikely, according to Representative Gomert, Texas Republican, former prosecutor, and member of the House Judiciary Committee. Imran Awan is a calculating person who made great efforts to cover his tracks both electronically and physically. Placing that laptop with his personal documents, which may well incriminate him, those he worked for, or both, in the dead of night in a House office building was a deliberate act by a cunning suspect, and it needs to be investigated. Even though the laptop was allegedly used only by an IT aide who worked for numerous members, Wasserman Schultz has hired an outside counsel, William Pittard, to argue that the laptop not be examined. What an amazing thing to argue in legal proceedings. I would like to, I would like to uh, proffer the idea that you don't get more information. And how convenient, as Trump announces, more forces being sent to Pakistan. It is all quite the rich tapestry. Pittard argued that the speech and debate clause, which only protects a member's information directly related to legislative duties, should prevent prosecutors from examining the laptop's com contents. That guy did not respond to requests for comments. Pittard is a partner with Kaiser Dillon. He's also the former acting general counsel of the House. Hiring an outside counsel to argue the speech and debate clause on behalf of Washington Schultz is highly unusual because the general counsel of the House offers opinions on speech and debate issues for free. You know, they kind of have lawyers that, that work there in the building. The most recent notable example of a member hiring an outside attorney to argue a more aggressive interpretation is former Louisiana Representative William Jefferson who was convicted August 4th, 2009, of using his office to try to enrich himself and the relatives through a web of bribes and payoffs involving business ventures in Africa. Investigators found $100,000 cash in his freezer. And that's the part that I go, oh, that's right, I remember that. 
The collection of documents found in Rayburn tied the laptop to Awan and ensured that police would keep the computer. The reporting officer wrote that when he saw Awan's name, he recalled guarding an interrogation of him a few months earlier. The attorney-client privilege notation also prevented police from immediately reviewing some of the papers. Nonetheless, the officer opened the MacBook and found that its login screen did not have Awan's username, but rather Rep DWS. We will continue to follow this story because it's fascinating. And it's amazing to watch all these little crony criminals just crawling around. Crony criminals crawling around. You're listening to the Cyberspace War edition of your Morning Monarchy for Tuesday, September 12th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. We are mixing world news and tech news, geopolitics and cyberspace war. Two days after credit monitoring company Equifax revealed that, because of its staggering negligence, hackers had managed to penetrate the company's meager cybersecurity defenses and abscond with up to 143 million social security numbers and a trove of other personal data, including names, addresses, driver's license, data, birth dates, and credit card numbers. The cyber thieves responsible are now threatening to sell the data to the highest bidders unless they receive a ransom of 600 Bitcoin, or about $2.6 million right now. In the ransom note, which was published on the dark web, the hackers said they were just two regular people trying to get by, and that while they didn't want to hurt anybody, they need to monetize the information as soon as possible, and they promised to delete the data as soon as the ransom was received. Quote, we are two people trying to solve our lives and those of our families. We did not expect to get as much information as we did, nor do we want to affect any citizen. But we need to monetize the information as soon as possible. The hackers have now made a ransom demand, stating on the dark web that they will delete their data for a ransom of 600 Bitcoin, as we said, $2.6 million. They said if they don't get it, by September 15th, that's this Friday, they will publicize the data. I'm bringing cybersecurity expert right now with Hotspot Shield, Robert Siciliano. Robert, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. What about that? How can victims of Equifax, uh, this breach, protect themselves? And, and what about this angle that many of these people didn't even want to be part of Equifax's portfolio and they were given free accounts? Yeah, this is just messy all around. Uh, the fact that... Uh their domain is, you know, EquifaxSecurity2017.com. It should be Equifax Fail. Uh, they messed up big time here. Uh, consumers are at a loss. They cannot rely on the government agencies or corporations to protect them from identity theft. Ultimately, the responsibility lies on you and I. I actually am a victim of this particular crime. I did a search on the website this morning, and yes, in fact, my social and my name showed up, and they're requesting that I sign up for their free uh, credit monitoring. That being said, uh, <laughs> one of the main things or most important things that consumers should do is get what's called a credit freeze. So a credit freeze, which you get through the credit bureaus, uh, is another layer of protection that locks down your social on your credit report, essentially preventing a lender from getting your credit scores. If they can't get your scores, they're not going to uh, extend any credit. If they're not going to extend any credit, to a certain degree, your identity is protected from new account fraud with a credit freeze. Yeah, I mean, this is this is half of the country, Kevin Kelly. I mean, this, and I know you have other news that we want to also bring out here, but but go ahead. Yeah, this this is unbelievable. I mean, one of the things on uh, Labor Day, I saw an ad from Experian saying, "Hey, is your information on the dark web? Sign up for a free trial." When they so they ran an ad for it, but they already knew they had been breached on the 29th. And what's fascinating is they knew on the 29th and. Three days later, in a regulatory filing, their CFO sold just under $1 million worth of shares. The CFO. That's unbelievable. Yeah, it really is. And so what day did he do that? Three days after they discovered it. What? what I, this is incredible. That's so the incredible. CFO, the CFO sold stock three days after they discovered it, and yesterday the stock was down 13%. Yes. Now, the company is saying he didn't know anything about it when he sold the stock. Yeah, pointing yeah, that the, out what the company is. The doing. issue, though, is he's an executive. He's a CFO. He would have to know. Man, executive management knows when something this big happens. But because the information is shared that we don't know about, I mean, this requires so much of the consumer to do their own due diligence on themselves, yeah. right? I mean, his experience of going on and finding out whether you were affected by this, um, how does a company deal with that? Yeah, Robert Siciliano, final word from you. H how worried should people be this morning? 
Well, this is the most sensitive of personal identifying information, names, birth dates, driver's license numbers, and of course your social security number. The most important thing again here is get a credit freeze, of course. Always pay attention to your credit card statements of, of you know, a couple of hundred thousand credit cards being compromised. Uh, download your credit card company or bank's mobile app and get alerts and notifications for every single charge. All right, we will leave it there. Robert, thanks very much for your insight this morning. We appreciate it. Robert Siciliano. Now, somebody asked in the chat, oh, who was that? I'm pretty sure that's yesterday's birthday girl, Maria Bartiromo, born on September 11th. You might recall that Joey Ramone wrote a love song to her from his hospital bed as he stared and watched financial news and fell in love with her. However, meanwhile, as has been reported already, two plaintiffs have filed a $70 billion class action lawsuit against Equifax in a Portland, Oregon federal court, a case that has the potential to completely crush the company with a massive payout. In the lawsuit, lawyers from Olson Danes PC, who filed it on behalf of plaintiffs Mary McHill and Brooke Reinhard, allege that Equifax was negligent in failing to protect consumer data and that the company chose to save money instead of spending on technical safeguards that could have stopped the attack. There's actually a little short video that shows Zach Whitaker basically going to their page and entering test as your name and one, two, three, four, five, six, and it'll tell you, oh yeah, your, your info has been breached. The BRICS Finance Committee is discussing a joint virtual currency for the five-nation bloc of developing economies, this according to the Russian Direct Investment Fund, during the BRICS Summit in China recently. Dmitriev from the Russian Direct Investment Fund told journalists that Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa could develop its own alternative to payment tools. While there is a focus on settlements in national currencies, cryptocurrencies are also being discussed as one of the possible settlement mechanisms. Now, on the latest episode of New World Next Week, deep programming note, there will be no New World Next Week this week. You may have heard Corbett make a brief reference to, oh yeah, bricks are going to come save us all with cryptocurrency, right? It could happen. Stranger things have happened. You know, strange things like dudes I know inventing a peer-to-peer -peer video sharing platform that is now blowing up and changing the world. YouTube has once again been accused of censorship after allegedly pulling down a video featuring Nigel Farage talking about Islam and immigration. The controversial film features excerpts from the UKIP founder speeches along with nostalgic views of British castles, landscapes, and cultural icons. It also features details of the growing number of Muslims living in the UK as well as shocking newspaper headlines about terrorism and images depicting the migrant crisis. In the film, Farage is quoted from speeches in which he talks about the polls which indicate the British public's disquiet with the level of immigration over the past decades. He also slams Merkel's migrant policy and discusses Sharia court in Britain. It was made by a UKIP supporter and Farage is not to have believed to have been involved in the making of it. The video was uploaded by an anonymous man called UKIPper who claimed his film was removed after being reported for hate speech and showed the son an email from YouTube which explained the decision to ban his video, blah, blah, blah. It's believed the maker of the video is linked to online community 8chan, which is known to have members who sympathize with the far right. Immigration and Islam are still quite taboo subjects. The blanket term of hate speech is cleverly used to silence dissent. YouTube is a heavily progressive platform who push transparently left-wing agendas. It was a good platform to get our messages out and talk about important issues until it cracked down. Now it's just another establishment monolith. But as The Sun reports, the video is now available on alternative video sharing sites, including BitChute. BitChute gets mentioned in mainstream press. It is tabloid press, but press nonetheless. Huge congratulations to Apollo and Ray and all the other people who have created BitChute.com. It is the YouTube killer. Now, our last couple of stories here. And what's either a generous act of charity or an unnerving example of the control Tesla exercises over its vehicles, or maybe both, Tesla CEO Elon Musk 
magically unlocked the batteries of every Tesla in Florida to maximize the distance that people fleeing from Hurricane Irma could travel before having to stop to refuel at one of the company's superstation charging centers. Innovative luxury car manufacturer Tesla is giving those Tesla owners in Florida an extra boost in the wake of Hurricane Irma. Now, um, if you have a Tesla, you know that the battery is capped at 60 kilowatt hours per the software, but Tesla has now remotely allowed their owners to have their battery be fully unleashed at 75 kilowatt hours. Now, um, a one Redditor had in Florida, sorry, in Florida had notices in their car and were surprised that Tesla did this. And Tesla went on the record with the statement saying, quote, we at Tesla hope that you and your loved ones are safe while preparing for the hurricanes approaching Florida. Due to these exceptional circumstances and to help you better prepare to evacuate and get to safety, your vehicle has been adjusted at no cost to you to temporarily access the additional battery capacity until September 16th. You will notice the badging on the instrument cluster will read 75 during this period. We hope that this allows you to travel to your next destination with confidence and ease. This is super cool. Tesla's actually doing what they can to make sure people are safe and that they can evacuate. Thoughts, five words or less. A potentially profit charged move. Now, really interesting move here. This would essentially be like if suddenly you were running from some storm and you had your fondle slab and it was running low on batteries and you suddenly got a message from Tim Cook that said, you know, because you're running from the Eagle Creek fires, we've magically unlocked the ability for your, you know, your fondle slab's battery totally won't die. Oh, so you mean the battery has more power than you're letting us have, and you just gave us some extra power? You threw us a crumb from your Lex Luthor-like castle? Thanks so much, buddy. That's quite, quite, quite interesting. Elon Musk magically extends the battery life of Tesla vehicles fleeing Hurricane Irma. Good thing that solar flare didn't get him, because last Wednesday, massive two solar flares Monster belches, they're calling them. The sun produces the most powerful solar flare in about 12 years. On Wednesday, NASA recorded two massive solar flares. One was the biggest flare in 12 years. They were so powerful, they kept some radios from working for about an hour. The two solar flares shot out of a sunspot that's seven Earths wide and nine Earths tall. Astronomers identified them as X-class flares, which generate as much energy as millions of hydrogen bombs and emit enough radiation to interfere with high-frequency radio waves here on Earth. Solar flares occur when the sun's magnetic field suddenly releases energy like a snapping rubber band. It sends huge amounts of energy and light into space. The event is somewhat surprising because the sun is nearing a period of low activity it cycles through about once every 11 years. But there's been quite a bit of activity on the star's surface. The same sunspot sent five sizable solar flares total into the atmosphere since Monday. Earth's magnetic field shields us from the most dangerous effects of these giant explosions, but scientists think the flares might still trigger a geomagnetic storm. This could disrupt satellites, GPS navigation, and even create auroras seen as far south as Ohio or Indiana. Squibbly blam, there you have it. Geopolitics, cyberspace war crammed together. Two great tastes that taste great together. And again, everything we say and play will always be included in the show notes. We didn't expect to get as much information as we did, but we need to monetize the information as soon as possible. We've got brand new music from Brian Warner. That's right, Marilyn Manson. He debuted a brand new track yesterday on 9-11, and we've got that swear-filled track coming up for you in just a few minutes. But first, this day in history. Past is prologue, September 12th, 1857. The SS Central America sinks about 160 miles east of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, drowning a total of 426 passengers, including Captain William Lewis Herndon. The ship was carrying you know, 13 to 15 tons of gold from the California gold rush. I like how that syncs with yesterday's gold rush from Building 5 at the World Trade Center complex. September 12, 1910, the premiere performance of Gustav Mahler's Symphony No. 8 in Munich had a chorus of 852 singers, an orchestra of 171 players. September 12, 1923, Southern Rhodesia, today, called Zimbabwe, is annexed by the United Kingdom. And another example of crypto things I didn't know about while I lived in the state, I don't really remember hearing anything about the Mothman. It was only when I moved away that I learned about it. 
September 12, 1952, strange occurrences, including a monster sighting, take place in Flatwoods, West Virginia. They call it the Flatwoods Monster. September 12, 1953, U.S. Senator and future assassinated President John Fitzgerald Kennedy marries Jacqueline Lee Bouvier at St. Mary's Church in Newport, Rhode Island. September 12, 1958, Jack Kilby demonstrates the first working integrated circuit while working at Texas Instruments. September 12, 1959, Bonanza premieres the first regularly scheduled TV program presented in color. September 12, 1962, again, President John F. Kennedy at a speech at Rice University reaffirms that the U.S. will put a man on the moon and do the other stuff I can't remember. That's that speech, right? We were just laughing about that the other day. It always makes me laugh. We pledge to go to the moon and do that other stuff. Love to see that. Written in the sky. And the other things. September 12, 1977, South African anti-apartheid activist Steve Biko dies in police custody, as was the style all the time. September 12, 1980, there was a military coup in Turkey on this day. And speaking of the banksters in Connecticut, on this day in 1983, a Wells Fargo depot in West Hartford, Connecticut, is robbed of $7 million by Los Macheteros. Now, when you look up Los Macheteros, oh, you're the, the machetes. They wanted them out of America. In 1983... September 12, 1983, that same day, the USSR vetoes a United Nations Security Council resolution deploring the Soviet destruction of Korean Airlines Flight 007. September 12, 1987, Morrissey left the Smiths for a solo career, and we've got the brand new album art from his upcoming solo record that we'll show you on Friday's episode. Now, the sinks just keep on coming, and I learned a lot about this from our friend Lauren Coleman in his book, The Copycat Effect. September 12th, 1994. Frank Eugene Corder, an American truck driver, stole a Cessna 150 late on the night of 9-11-94 and crashed the stolen aircraft onto the south lawn of the White House on September 12th, 1994, apparently trying to hit the building. Good morning, everyone. An extraordinary breach of security. Early this morning, a plane, a small plane, crashing on the south lawn of the White House. There was some damage to the White House. President Clinton and family were not in the White House at the time. For more on the story, we go to ABC's Ann Compton. And do we know whether this was a terrorist attack, an attack designed to harm the president? That is always what the White House Secret Service presumes. And oh, when the, pres the president was not at home when this happened, but he was supposed to be in a bedroom window not far from where the plane came to arrest. You can see the large, you can't see really the plane very well, but you see the large magnolia tree, hundred, oh, more than 100 years old. The plane tumbled into it, snapped off a branch, and actually crashed into a window on the main floor of the White House. The president's bedroom is upstairs, just above that is the state dining room, then the president's bedroom window. He is still uh, staying at Blair House across the street because of some air conditioning repairs being done at the White House. What makes this extraordinary is the idea, the plane, according to eyewitnesses, came in with no engine on. Uh, one, one eyewitness told me that the plane kind of banked to the right and went right in over the White House. Several eyewitnesses uh, uh, were talked to this morning. Uh, this is what they had to say before dawn. All I can say, it was, it was like a, sm a smooth glide. You know, like you have a glider, mm -hmm. and it was, it was kind of like gliding like that. The engines were off. Yeah, I didn't hear. Quiet. I didn't hear no engines. How long and, was the crash? It was like a boom, you know, just like that, you know. And that's all I saw. I was looking for some uh, smoke and fire, but I didn't see none of that at all. I was on Freedom Park up right. there, uh, at the top of Executive Park, right. right alongside the White House. When I seen the light go by, and then heard the impact. It apparently it bounced because it was like a secondary impact. Now, bomb squads have checked the wreckage. They say they haven't found any explosives. If this was supposed to blow up, but it still is very, very worrying to the Secret Service. They don't know where the plane came from, at least not yet. And two quick questions. Uh, what do we know about the pilot, and were there any gunshots? The uh, security guards at the White House certainly have the capacity to fire on planes coming into the area. Well, we have also always been told that there's anti-aircraft missiles implanted secretly around the White House to uh, ward off of a military attack, but apparently no shots were fired. 
The question of where the plane came from is a, 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 a real one. The pilot's body is still in the wreckage. It has not been removed. And there is some report that the plane came from a suburban Maryland area, although we're quite close to a national airport. President Clinton was in Maryland yesterday at an event, but so far there's been no official comment of whether there could be any connection. And no identity as to who the pilot was. They, ha they, they have not released okay. the identity of the pilot who died. September 12, 1994, Frank Eugene Corder fatally crashes a single-engine Cessna 150 into the White House's South Lawn, striking the West Wing. There were no other casualties. Because Billy wasn't there because of air conditioner repair. They really must have terrible air conditioner because we can look from USA Today. August 7th, White House gets new HVAC system, which is another reason why Trump wasn't there. Continuing to look at this day in history, September 12th, 1996, Oasis canceled their U.S. tour, citing internal differences. 1998, a concert by Shania Twain was televised live on DirecTV. It was the first time direct broadcast had been used for a country star. September 12th, 2001, Anset Australia, Australia's first commercial interstate airline, completely collapses due to increased strain on the international airline industry on September 12th, 2001, leaving 10,000 people unemployed. September 12, 2002, the house that Kurt Cobain lived in as a child was sold on eBay for $210,000. It was worth $52,000. September 12, 2003, the United Nations lifts its sanctions against Libya after that country agreed to accept responsibility and recompense compensation. The families of victims in the 88 bombing of Pan Am Flight 103. That same day, in Fallujah, U.S. forces mistakenly shoot and kill eight Iraqi police officers. Whoops, my finger slipped. Whoops, some finger slipped. September 12th, 07, former Philippine President Joseph Estrada is convicted of plunder. And in 2008, the 2008 Chatsworth train collision in L.A. between a Metrolink commuter train and a Union Pacific freight train kills 25. And finally, 9-12-2011, the 9-11 Memorial Museum in New York City opened to the public. Published to my own website a decade ago today, September 12th, 2007, Seattle Post Intelligent blogger Ron Schott says I was wrong on 9-11 Truth. He had originally posted an article making fun of 9-11 Truthers. It was called Inside Job People Are Out of Their Incorrectly Spelled Minds. You mean T-H-E-I-R, dummy. I also, on this day, published the one photo I took personally of the World Trade Center. It was from the Empire State Building. I pretty much lived in New York the summer of 99. Celebrating birthdays today on September 12th, another amazing list. H.L. Mencken, Maurice Chevalier, New York Times publisher Arthur Hayes Salzberger. It's also another publisher, Alfred A. Knopf Sr.'s birthday, Jesse Owens, Ian Holm, George Jones, born on this day. It's also Henry Wackman's birthday, Linda Gray, Leonard Peltier, born on this day in 1943. It's also the late, great Barry White's birthday, Joey Pants, Joe Panigliano, Neil Pert, Nan Golden, Sam Brownback, Rachel Ward, Hans Zimmer, Greg Gutfield, Ben Folds, Larry Lalonde, we were just playing New Primus the other day, Nathan Larson from Shudder to Think, the late Paul Walker, Busy Bone, Simpsons guest star Yao Ming, Jennifer Hudson, and Emmy Rossum. You might try and play some George Jones on your daily DJ set at noon. That's right, you get an hour DJ set and an hour-long new show each and every day. And we reach the end where I premiere brand new music for you. Heaven Upside Down is the upcoming 10th studio album by Marilyn Manson. We Know Where You Fucking Live was premiered yesterday by Zane Lowe on Beats One, who confirmed that Heaven Upside Down will come out on October 6th. And that's how we wrap up this episode. I thank you so much. You keep us going and growing. You keep independent media on the air. Thanks to you at MediaMonarchy.com slash support. That's your double whammy geopolitics cyberspace war episode for Tuesday, September 12th, 2017. And I am James Evan Pilato for MediaMonica.com. Again, thanking you so much for listening and taking part and reminding you, as always, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult. All remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.